1st of March, 2017. And I don't know what my name is. I try to get out of bed, try to work out what I'm going to do, but I can't work out what my name is. Six months beforehand, I decided, after much Prosecco and free champagne, to post on Facebook about the fact I was transgender. At that moment, changed not only my life, but the lives of my family. What turned into a, from a selfish act that was necessary for me, had repercussions that I never dreamed of. So when I woke up on the 1st of March last year, I had just sold my business, an IT company that I'd run for 25 years, that I couldn't face transitioning during that working environment, I couldn't face coming out to my partners, I couldn't face coming out to my staff, I couldn't face coming out to my customers. What I hadn't appreciated was that my family weren't quite ready to join me on my journey. So there I was, unemployed, without a real plan, and a family that weren't quite behind me. So I thought about applying for some interim roles. The first line on a CV is your name. My LinkedIn profile had my old name. I wasn't ready to rebrand myself at that point. I still was in that turmoil of going forward, but I can't. Staying where I am, but I can't. And I found myself on the verge of painting myself back into a corner and bottling out because of my family. So I applied for a few roles as Mark I, the classic me, but my heart wasn't in it. And I spoke to a few recruiters at the time and said, look, this is me, this is who I am. Do you think that's going to be a problem? Will I struggle to find a role as a trans woman? And they said, be blunt, yes. That's not very PC, but yes, you will. You've erased a lot of privilege, a lot of capital that I've built up over many years. No longer did I have that white male privilege. I was now a minority, someone a bit different. Nobody has targets for recruiting more trans people. There's no gender target to have trans people on the board. There's no ethnic target to get more trans people involved. So I was now in this minority. So I decided that I could either lay in bed and cry about this, or I could get up and put a plan into action. I decided to believe in myself. I'd read the rule book, trans people. You're gonna lose your family, lose your job, you can lose your house. People are gonna reject you, they're gonna laugh at you, they're gonna misgender you. You would have no respect. And I thought, I don't wanna read that book. I wanna get out there and say, actually, I am a valid person. I can do this role. Just because I look different, because I sound different, I'm still the same person on the inside. I rebranded my LinkedIn profile. I phoned up recruiters as Joanne. I didn't lead with the fact I was trans. But then I realized one of the barriers I faced was my voice match. So I started getting major anxieties when someone said, oh, the first phase is a telephone interview. And 
Hello, can I speak to Joanne? Joanne speaking. Sorry, can I speak to Joanne? Yes, it's Joanne speaking. Sorry, can I speak to Joanne? It's a bit of a bad line. It's still Joanne speaking. Oh, okay, okay. And already, I'm one step backwards. Already this person's confused, and I've lost my momentum and lost my passion. Now I'm thinking, oh God, I'm trans. I'm never going to get the job. I've been for face-to-face -face interviews. I walk into reception, and the recruiter, you can see them coming towards me, smiling, beaming all over their face. Hi. Ah. Oh. Their eyes flick. The conversation starts to dry up. And that slow walk to the water cooler, can I get you a drink? The conversation is very tricky. So I've developed a technique for making light of it. Talk about the weather like you do. But trying to put that person at ease. So I found that I had to do that work. But again, I already felt as if I was behind the curve. I lost that momentum. And that person was now maybe struggling to try and see how they would fit. It's a lot harder as a trans person to get a drop job. Should it be? I often meet recruiters and say, so would you hire me? Of course, yeah, yeah, we're a diverse company. We support everybody. It's the best person for the job. OK. So if I'm the best person for the job, along with another perfect fit for the job and another perfect fit for the job, how much better do I have to be than the white male? How much better does the black woman have to be than the white male? be selected for that role. How much better do I have to be than both of those candidates to be selected for that role? So when we talk about that feeling of we want to recruit a diverse workforce, I'll be walking that talk. We talk about ROI, culture, ethos, building these diverse talent pools. Are we serious? Some are, some aren't. But I found in my experience that everybody is pleased to meet me, but that necessarily want to hire me. So I decided to find, found a business promoting diversity and inclusion to companies to challenge them. So okay, yes. You may employ me, you sit me behind a desk. If I'm a DevOps, if I'm a coder, maybe on the phones, call centers, contact centers, sure. But would you put me in your boardroom? Would you put me on your SMT? Would you make me your sales director? You're seeing your best client on Friday, million pound contract, and I'm in charge of the deal. How do you feel? Confident. But then you realize this customer is public sector. They're a university. And maybe I actually match their core values. Suddenly they look at your company, your business, going, wow, this is the kind of people we want to do business with. They employ people for their talent, for their skills. And it shouldn't be a negative. Because we, whatever business we're in, should represent our customer base, our society, and also our other employees. Because if we are diverse, the country is diverse, the world is diverse. So why are we sometimes afraid to step out of that comfort zone? And not necessarily make a brave hire, but make the right hire outside of what we say is the norm. So to me, there's a continuum of inclusion. 
And to quote Oprah Winfrey, I see you. I hear you. Or what you say matters to me. So if you matter to somebody and they're prepared to listen to you, that is how you build an inclusive culture. If you're not listening to somebody, you're excluding them. And we can exclude people inadvertently. There's no vegan option. There's no stairs to the building. The application forms don't cater for people who don't like to fill in forms. We expect everybody to fit in the same boxes. So people maybe who are slightly autistic don't like working in noisy open plan offices. Introverts don't like someone walking straight and demanding an answer. Extroverts want to have their say and express themselves, think quickly. So without realising it, we can actually exclude much of the talent pool. And if we do hire them, then how are they going to feel when they join your organisation and find they're part of a culture that doesn't fit? What we want to do is start more than tolerate people. The last thing we want to do is put up with people because we have to, because there's a statistic, because the HR policy says so, because the Equality Act 2010 says we must employ more people. So we bring people in and we don't engage with them. Then we start to accept people for who they are. But where we want to be is embraced. Hey, Joe, thank you for coming. Great, come on in here. Great, everyone meet Joe. It's fantastic she's here. As Werner Mayer said, you know, diversity is being invited to the party. It includes being asked to dance. And that's really true, because if you're inviting people to your party and you're not engaging, you're not talking to them, why have you invited them? They just think worse of you. When we think about Maslow, if we're not careful, when we start to exclude people, either inadvertently, whether we bully them, whether we harass them, make them feel unwelcome, it destabilizes their whole sense of self. Before long, depression kicks in, sickness days go up, and they're not fully functional human beings. We spend a lot of our time at work, and it's important we value people when they're there. How often do we think, well, we have to manage this person out? They're not performing. Well, maybe the company's not performing. Maybe the person's great. They're just not looked after. They don't know how to fit into your culture. So is your workplace a safe place? Do you have a zero tolerance policy on harassment? Are allowed, people are allowed to bring themselves to work and be open about who they are? Is workplace banter rife? Nobody wants to shut down fun. Nobody wants to make work boring. But we have to understand what is funny to some people isn't funny to others. And what may seem like an innocent remark to you may not be to them. So I think everybody has the right be treated with dignity and respect and valued for who they are. Thank you.